Recorded live. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be across the nation or around the world. Once again, you're listening to the VMware Communities Roundtable Podcast. This is podcast number 662. My name is Eric Nielsen, and with me today, I have my regular co-host, Matt Lungeth. Today is Wednesday, September 27th, 2023. Matt, how are you doing? Eric, I am well. I am back from the Boston UserCon last week, and I have to say, I heard some good feedback. You know, often I kind of misnomed this and occasionally we do have listeners to both this podcast and, and video blog that are out there and the episodes of the late have really resonated with the customers and, and partners and even VMware employees that are out there to hear some of these stories that were reminiscing and I and I was sorry I wasn't able to participate in last week's call but I have to say I think that the conversation between yourself and John Furrier was one of our best of, of recent memory. And to that end, we have uh, an episode about the history of hands-on labs, and, and we'll get into all of that in just a minute. But before we touch on all of those points, sir, my favorite questions. How are you? How are things out on the West Coast? And what is the color of the bay? I do hear things are a little smoky out in the valley. We... we... We did have a little smoke uh, the last week and a half, but nothing orange, nothing. Just a little light blue haze happening from one fire that's up north. Um, and so, it, but it hasn't been bad. Not like the years where everything was orange and sucked in. So it's it's not comparable. And if you didn't know better, you probably wouldn't even notice that we had a little little bit of blue haze. It reminds me of the pollution before we got electric cars, right? Like now, California air is really clear and crystal now, and you don't see any more haze in the valley uh but uh yeah a little bit of fire actually going on but it is it is nice weather we've had you know 72 degrees uh chillier at night now almost want to turn on the heater when it gets into like 62 degrees in the house it's a little chilly downright frigid oh, out there in northern california classic. at 62 yeah, exactly. Class of the end of September weather. You know, get excited about Halloween season coming up and uh, and enjoying enjoying California and the color of the bay. You know, we were out there the other day, and it's just a it's a nice solid green with a little light chop because it's we had a little weather come through. We had a little rain come through, so you know we're coming into the winter land for California, as we say. A little light drizzle and sixty two degrees. You know, if we have to put on our winter parkas and stuff to bundle up for that. Uh, but uh, happy times here. Um, looking forward to all the activity that's happening with VMware Explore Europe. Um, that's looking really well. We're funding everything. Everything's a green. The community community uh, VMTN booth with uh, V Brown Bang will be there, and the community sessions are filling up, um, and the code sessions are full. And you know, some of the some vendors are going to be there. Some VMware people are going to be doing some in interesting code sessions. So that's all happening, you know, and really well. We've got the Code Labs funded code lab sessions with uh, with uh, Chat GPT and Chat GTP programming, and I've asked those guys to add the Hackathon plugin that allows you to ask for. PowerShell scripts to control virtualization using PowerShell with using chat GPT. So we'll extend that lab a little bit, a little bit better than the one in Vegas where we didn't have that plugin. So uh, thanks to the hackathon for bringing that to our attention. The hackathon is also funded. It's going to be an external event uh, in a really cool space, you know, uh, you know, down, back down into the city. And so we're debating on whether we're going to have buses for you guys or just get everybody over there because it's by the hotel area. But the hackathon space is cool. Um, well, like we did, I think in 2018, where we, you know, lease the space, everybody comes together and it feels like an event. It's just not at the, not at the, not in a session room. So looking forward to that as well. The expert party, we're going to get something going there. I haven't talked to Corey yet, but looks like everything's uh, funded. Everybody's get excited. I got my tickets. Some of my people got their tickets now. So everything's green and looking forward to, you know, seeing everybody and being in uh, in Europe for Explore in Barcelona. So that's where we're going. Matt, I have not heard whether you're going to be able to get yourself free to go or not, but we should probably talk about that. Time will tell. Yes, we should. Yes, yes, we should. This is true. We are coming into the October season where everything will be uh, 
excited. I would say that uh, I'm excited to have my tickets, which means that, you know, coming out of the Broadcom acquisition, I will be still working at VMware doing, or I guess Broadcom doing something. Don't know what my position will be or whether I'll have a long-term position, but I should be into November because I now have tickets and several of their teams does as well. So it's always fun to, you know, hear that and know that and looking forward to a very fun November, right? So with that. Uh, anything else before we get over to HOL with Doug Doug Bear Bar Bear 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 Beer? I like beer, you know, a boot. <laughs> you know, weddings, we were like drinking a lot. So, Doug, welcome to the show. Uh, we've had you on many times before. Uh, Doug uh, works on content for HOL. So, why don't you tell us a little bit what your title is, what you do, and then we'll get into the, the history of HOL and some fun throwback topics while we then look forward as well. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Uh, actually, you know, so uh, I have a long history with the hands-on labs, uh, basically going back to 2005, where I was a customer, and I would actually go through at VMworld and collect the lab manuals because, you know, that's what we did is we printed lab manuals. And, uh, you know, that was a way to kind of take some of VMworld back with me. Um, I contributed to the labs in 2008 and 2009 as a content creator. And then uh, I started working for VMware in 2013 when they created a core team for the hands-on labs. And so I've been on the hands-on labs team uh, well, from 2013 to the end of last year. Uh, so I actually moved on to a new role, but uh, from a historical perspective, I can definitely talk about uh, what's going on in the hands-on labs. Yeah, so to get that right, you were an external employee, somebody working in externally, and they recruited you to do HOL, or did you work at VMware collecting lab manuals? Uh, so I collected lab manuals when I was a customer. In uh, 2008 and 2009, I was a partner, and I was recruited to help with the PowerShell and Perl labs. Uh, back That's in those awesome. days, we did the, uh, the instructor-led, so it was all, you know, a room of 25 people, an instructor at the front, uh, still printed lab manuals. Um, so now did yeah. you get a special badge or did they pay for you to come to the, sh or at least get you a free ticket when you would come work and collecting lab manuals? Uh, so I did get a, a free ticket when I, uh, when I created content and presented. Those were fun days. Uh, did you guys get shirts or jackets or anything like that too, from that, from that space? I know back in the day, it was like it's kind of fun to be in that space where you were, you know, running the labs. It was like a very clicky team. You know, it was the who's who of kind of like <laughs> who knew how to do virtualization back then, right? In the early. I was a total fanboy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I got a bowling shirt, you know, the, in 2008. So we, uh, before we kind of corporatized the hands-on labs, you know, back in the, the early days, it was bowling shirts that the lab team would get. Yeah, those were, those were fun days too because no one knew virtualization, so people were coming in and just like lines waiting to get into labs, right? You know, and it, it hadn't gone into this full scale, bring your own device, massive amount of people. It was it was uh, it was it was interesting and fun back in those days, right? Like I, I remember that um, when those days i believe on prem you got everybody had to go in and set up hols on machines on prem there was no such thing as the cloud back then right it was just like and i remember one year i forget what year it was eight nine or whatever the, at the bottom of the escalators in uh, Moscone, they had like a big rack environment where they set up the servers and that's where they and they spent a lot of time you know two days before and they only could only get in the venue, you know, two days before Saturday or whatever. And they had to build a whole little mini data center there and get everything running. And it was back in those days, dicey. If I remember Matt, whether the stuff was even going to run. Right. And I think we had some days where things didn't run right. And there were lines <laughs> and shutdowns for HOL for like two hours while they rebooted everything. Remember, did, did you experience any of that, that stress? So I wasn't part of the, the infrastructure team uh, during the that year. It was 2008 or 2009, I wish I could remember. But they built that mini data center. So it was the first year we had Cisco UCS back in the labs. And it was the first year that like Project California had been kind of released as UCS. So it was 
kind of fresh off the assembly line equipment. So there were all kinds of uh, extra challenges in addition to, you know, kind of building that data center completely in Moscone at the last minute. So Matt, did you experience as a, you know, an external guy back then, any of the HOL infrastructure, were you even able to come to explore back in the early 2010s? No, I wasn't. My first explore was 2017, 2018. Uh, I have been a user and had two five in production. So since 2004, 2005, um, but was never able to attend Explore until I had actually switched over uh, into several different roles um, throughout my IT career and then actually came left the industry as a whole, as I've had talked about before, where I went into more of a uh, IT consultant for a parent company that had some interest in uh, pipe and steel for the, the Marcellus shale play here in the U.S. or the United States. It's particularly the Northeast. Uh, also some retail interest in then some real estate, but then I decided to make a change. I came back in and picked up as an IT director at a local uh, manufacturer that made automotive accessories. And the first year that I was back at that, that role, I uh, was able to, to figure out a way through the VExpert community uh, to attend Explore. So my interaction with hands-on labs has always been from, from a step back from, from this history. But Doug, I, I will say about one of that. When is the first time that you can remember where we moved from that, you know, where we're building the full stack, right, uh, on w within the show to using more, let's call it, it could either be co-load or true cloud services where we weren't running around trying to stand up a whole entire data center <laughs> instead of two days in a, a giant convention center that's controlled um, you know, I think that's the other thing behind the scenes of all of this, Eric, you and I have talked yeah. about it a couple of different times throughout, you know, as we get closer to yeah. explore the constraints that maybe the general audience isn't aware of that when you're in a, in a place like Moscone, that the mere idea of picking something up or putting down a piece of gaff tape. <laughs> well, but before we, before we even get to that, be interesting. I, I had a, a one layer before that layer, right? Which is when Doug started, it was kind of like volunteer, right? And it was like customers and everybody, they didn't have a full-time HOL group, right? It was just people working in engineering and SEs and a collection of customers that were handing out lab. It was just a free group that, and it was, that's why it was so clicky because it was like, you got recruited into that and you had to be of a certain caliber to even be part of their, and it wasn't a team inside of VMware. And then at some point, they actually kind of created a team that then reported into central engineering, if I remember right, or something. Uh, and there was one, one of the guys from Europe was a big, a big community guy that ended up, I can't remember his name, but he took over and then ran HOL for, so Doug, do you remember when it started to become less it more formalized as a as a group building HOL versus when it was just a collection of people? Sure. Well, so those those two questions actually come, they dovetail yep. really well. So uh, I we started on the way. yeah, <laughs> I started on the team officially in 2013. And in 2013 we were all cloud. So everything ran out of um, VMware data centers running cloud director with you know on-prem data centers. Uh, so prior to that, we I know in 2012 it was cloud, and I don't remember if in 2011 it was also cloud-ish, <laughs> or you know when they kind of made the full transition from on-prem to running in the cloud. Right. So there was a guy Pablo that took over, but before Pablo, there was a another guy that would run that ran the Mornave. whole thing. What it say the name? May have been Mornave. I think. Mornay, that's it. That's the name I was okay. trying to get. So Mornay <laughs> was kind of the first guy that started what I would call a formal team to run. And it was like 
coming together and it was still kind of volunteer selecty, but they actually had then an HOL, what I'd call director that was then going to run, you know, the infrastructure and start building out and then, you know, continue on. And I think that that happened for a few years from 2010 to 2012 or 13 before you came. And then I think somewhere Mornay gave it up and they moved to cloud services, uh, but Mornay run, ran it still on in on prem still built and he, Mornay might have been part of the guy that built it at the bottom of the elevator i don't or escalators i don't remember but i know that there was a mid transition where it kind of went formal it you know it had a director and it had budget and then and then eventually then it went cloud and then pablo started taking over some of that elements but not just the marketing front end not the rest so i don't know if that rings a bell or not yeah so um to be, to be clear, I guess, we started out and it was 100% volunteers. Uh, when when Mornay started kind of having people who actually ran uh, the infrastructure, I don't know if that was a formal group within VMware or if it was still people kind of contributing part of their time. Uh, I when think I started, they had oh, a small team of like three or four or five, like some number that dealt with the infrastructure and making sure the labs were built to run because i think i think prior to that they had some of these outages and it started to get embarrassing for the explore <laughs> event team got angry and said we need to put somebody in charge of this so we can wring their neck when we get outages right because there were <laughs> yeah i don't know if you but remember that was, the outage that was dates. 2012 yeah that's so, yeah okay. <laughs> uh 2013 okay. when i started is when they said hey look we're going to have an actual team and uh, we built a small team that basically okay. owned hands-on labs uh, for basically year round. Uh, so to kind of step back, all of the content is still developed 100% by volunteers. So people yeah. within VMware are the ones who create those labs and they're the ones who support the labs. So uh, somewhere between three and 400 people we bring online every year to create the new lab content. Uh, there's still just a small team that, that uh, manages the entire lab project. process yeah, yeah. Right. and so the lab program actually we moved from um, hands-on labs at vmworld to vmware hands-on labs which are available online 24 7. and so actually the uh, explore event is a, a kind of a small part of the overall labs program as far as content delivered uh, so the, the team's delivered about 4 million labs online since 2012, uh, 2013, I guess, when we started tracking. And, you know, of those, like at Explore in uh, Las Vegas, we delivered a little over 7,000 labs. And, uh, you know, we kind of, in 2021, we were delivering 12,000 labs every week. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, it's that, it's that, like that, the program that, has just kind of right, grown by right. leaps and bounds since we started. I feel like we're talking about now a big farm, right? Where where you have orange trees, plum trees, apple trees, cornfields, and each component of this kind of well, there was the original labs, and that's that's like peach trees, right? And like, and then there was creating the labs, and then there's the customers consuming the labs all over the place, and yeah, it has grown into a mega farm, right? With John mm -hmm. Deere massive tractors harvesting everything because you're doing seven thousand a month versus the old days. I kind of miss the old days where labs were exclusive and you had to come to, you know, like uh, to VMworld and stand in line and, you know, get, get a lab. And then you were in a lab and it was like, I felt like as soon as it all went online, everybody could do it all over the place. You could do it whenever you wanted. And it took away that excitement of going to explore or VMworld and getting in line and getting a spot and getting a lab and running the software, which, wasn't necessarily as available either. I think I feel like HOL enabled it. Uh, the downloads, you know, got much better. You can go online and download anything now and get things set up. So the exclusivity uh, and the lines at the bar have slowly gone away, right? Like you know, you know when you go into a good bar because it takes it's hard to get in, right? And then they they don't even let Matt in because they're like, no, sorry, you, 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 you know, <laughs> nobody with a beard or a mustache, you don't get to get in. But it is it is interesting that whole transition 
that happen and then the and then that general availability uh then you start talking about gamification and they you know they went they, they started doing odyssey and teams competing and it was like an event in itself right like that and some mm -hmm. of that i think was done to add the excitement back because we didn't have a line at the bar anymore so let's because they're generally available online why would you come to explore to do them when you you could just do them you know then there is also the concept of uh, when they're available, right? Like, so then Explore became the place where you were launching new labs, right? Or at least I felt like that when I was going to come to Explore, that's the first taste I was going to get of whatever the new tech was, the announcements. And you guys started to align uh, the announcements. So let's talk a little bit about, cause you worked on, you know, dealing with making sure new labs were coming through the pipeline, right? I think that was part yep. of your, your job. So how did that start trying, how did that start up? And then what were the transitions that happened there? Sure. So, uh, you know, we, we actually thought about that a lot about the, uh, you know, kind of cannibalizing the, uh, the excitement and the labs availability at explore. And we thought, you know, hey, if we make these available online all the time, are people going to want to still come to the labs to explore? And, you know, we actually had a line at Las Vegas this year. So people still, even though it's online, like you said, we, we release new content at explore. So people, you know, they want to see the new stuff, they'll come to explore and still be able to see the new stuff. So for example, we released two brand new labs at explore, um, you know, basically a AI related type labs that were announced during the keynote. And then we had a lab for them during the event. Uh, you know, so as far as content development, you know, we start in uh, February of every year. And uh, that's when we talk to the business units, see what uh, what's on the plan for, you know, between now and or then and uh, the Explore conference, uh, look at our development cycle. And then we onboard our volunteers and lab teams to be able to create each of each of those labs. Um, you know, so kind of there's a whole process of developing the labs according to our baseline templates with the new software or the latest version we can get, and then uh, going through a, a bunch of testing to make sure we don't have those uh, those repeats of the uh, embarrassing, you know, outages or downtime during the event. So, uh, yeah, we. We're kind of, Oh, go ahead. Just as, as an aside, they did offer us lab space this year for the chat GPT lab because we were sold out and they offered us like a slot in a 50 person room. But there is a process to do it. And we were way too late to you know get that set up and get it verified and in a VM, the lab, the process, the, you know, like there is a full process. How long do you think it takes from when somebody says, oh, we got something we want to do a lab to when it actually shows up in a lab? Sorry, I cut out there for just a second. <laughs> so the... oh, sure. How long does it take when you have an idea to when it's ready to go into production? I'm just uh -huh. curious because we tried to do that with the chat GPT labs and we only had like four weeks and we're like, I don't think we can make, that's way too soon. We can't get that going. <laughs> right? Yeah, that's a good question because there is the whole, you know, kind of is the software available, um, you know, and then do we have the resources available to be able to, uh, design the content, create the content, and then test the content. And then we have to stage all the content in time for the event, right? So uh, there were years where we had 20 different cloud instances where we had to publish the content. So, you know, we kind of, yeah. it, it, it takes months. So, uh, you know, we will usually, like I said, we start in February with the onboarding. Uh, generally, we'll start development sometime in April, and we try to finish by July to do testing. Uh, get every, get the clouds and the content tested for, you know, in August. I feel better now because they offered when the labs got open in schedule builder and they all sold out within a day. Right. Um, this was like in like July. Right. And they're like, <laughs> well, we could give you a lab and we could, you know, give you VMs and you could, we'll give you a 50 person. And I'm like, I, I don't think I can make that happen. Right. And, <laughs> And there's a quality level that you're expected to have if you're in yes. the HOL environment, right? And I don't think we would have been able to do that. So that makes sense. So that was just my own question. Going back to when you guys were transitioning into the cloud model, right? And you start doing this, what were some of the worst memories you can have on what didn't work? 
And I'll give you a moment <laughs> to think about that because that's not what you normally do. And so, but because we're in throwback world, right? We want to we want to hear the bad stories as well as the good ones. Well, I, I think one of the biggest challenges with when you go to a cloud is that everything's remote, right? So we we had our development cloud. And if you build one of these lab environments in your development cloud, yeah, you have a lab team that gets in and they they spec out, you know, we've got a vCenter, a bunch of ESXi hosts, some storage. You're just, you've got a mini data center that you're building for each of these labs. Well, when you get that and you have to move that to another cloud, that's a lot of data. You know, it's like for, for one lab, I think our averages were, were somewhere around 700 gigs of stuff that we needed to copy. And we had, you know, 40 of those things that we needed to put in different clouds. So just the the moving the data around was actually you know, quite a challenge, especially when you were moving something from California to London. You know that uh, <laughs> you'd have to. Everyone always said, "Well, we just put a b bunch of tapes on a truck and send it." But you know, there's kind of that whole problem of then no nobody can change their lab for a month while the tapes get made, the truck gets sent, and uh, you know everything. Gets yeah, I guess the logis logistics of that. You know, when we went and started doing Europe Explorer, then you had labs, and you had, yeah, and you had to propagate the labs in the clouds. In the early days, I think you probably just sent machine. I'm not even sure we did labs in, in Explorer for in Europe for. I don't even know. Like I didn't track much of that. Yeah, we did. Uh, you know, some of the other logistical challenges are like the 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 equipment from the room, right? So just building the room where we have 500 seats in a in a lab room, uh, you know, whether you ship that equipment all the way over to to Spain, for example, or whether you rent the equipment in Spain, you know, that's a a cost concern, but also a you know how close are the events scheduled together, and can it make it on the plane or the boat in time? So uh, I think yeah, logistics are fun. <laughs> yeah, we have that even for the Chad GPT labs, we've got little x86 servers and, you know, to ship ex little small x86 servers over there, they're like, okay, tell us the battery requirements and, you know, do we have to play tariffs and, you know, like they, are you going to bring them back and, you know, mm -hmm. like, you know, make sure they don't let in fire in the plane and then there's deadlines that have to be and you're like, I don't even have everything ready. And there, it is a logistical challenge, let alone getting over there and the power supplies and making sure that the power strips don't, you know, don't burn at 240 volts and, you know, on and on. And you're like, I don't know if I can, we can. Yeah. So I can imagine that then when you were doing the physical from point to point, but then when you did go cloud, all of the cloud problems, which are, are the cloud services the same? Can you get your data over there? How do you get your data over under? Everybody thinks, oh, that's just magic cloud, but no, there's there's logistics to that. <laughs> it's, you know, all of our clouds were running uh, VMware Cloud Director, right? So there's kind of that layer across the top. So you'd think all the clouds are pretty much the same, but every cloud kind of had its own personality just based on, you know, a variety of, things that go on there. Then we started getting into the online all the time, right? And did you guys ever consider just using the online infrastructure for the event infrastructure? Or how did you, did you keep those separate while everything was happening? Like, <laughs> uh, Great question. So actually some years we did use some of the online infrastructure. So, you know, because paying for that much capacity all the time um, can be expensive, right? So we started out and we'd say uh, we might shut down some of the, or reduce capacity for the production, the always on, and use that capacity for our large scale events. And then we got to the point where we could augment. So with uh, VMware Cloud on AWS becoming available, we actually would stand up some SDDCs in VMware Cloud on AWS and put labs there during the events. Doug, when did we make the transition from VCD over to Lab Manager? So it would be the other way, right? So we, um, since twenty twelve, since twenty thirteen, we've always used um, VCD. So we use it in a Lab Manager use case uh, because VCD effectively evolved from Lab Manager. Um, and so we've taken that and the lab manager use case is effectively the, I'm going to build one thing, uh, an entire environment. I'm going to capture that as a set of virtual machines 
And then for, I'm going to stamp out a whole bunch of those machines and, or a whole, whole bunch of those sets and give each lab user, excuse me, access to uh, their own set of machines, which are identical. Um, so we started using the VMware, you might be talking about the VMware lab platform. Yes, lab okay. platform, All right. forgive me. So yeah, I'm so that was actually- back to, to the episode that we did on 653, Great power to explore with David and Kelly Smith uh, in regards okay. to the whole entire lab platform and how that's evolved uh, into its own ecosystem now that we offer is not only is an internal use case for instances like this, but then for customers and partners as well. Okay. So the VMware lab platform consumes vCloud director uh, org VDCs effectively. So um, we... We, I think so. The, the VMware Lab platform used to be called the VMware Learning Platform. And before that, it was a Project Knee. So it was the next generation education environment, I think. That whole project came out of uh, starting with, I think, Mornay's group, where they would build the interface for uh, labs at VMworld or Explore. And then, you know, they would actually build uh, kind of a new interface every year. And it became as something they said, we're building this every year. Why don't we just build something and we can enhance it every year? Right, so they enhanced it. They We kind of ran it through a couple of VM worlds uh, to make sure it was okay. Uh, that was the when we started putting it online. And then they said, okay, we can trust this thing. Let's productize it. And kind of the rest is, is history. And how does, if at all, from, from the early days, as far as when we're, you know, whether it was the on-premises actually at the, the, at the show or maybe even more importantly, when we were transitioning over to, you know, Colo, our, our history with what would have been VD, yeah, VDM, then over to Vue, then over to Horizon fit into that as far as a delivery endpoint or a delivery front end into the labs themselves. So they, I know they used prior to transitioning over to uh, the VMware lab platform model, uh, which basically uses a, a web-based version of the VMRC. Uh, you know, that's kind of how it's delivered today, where you can just fire up a web browser and it's a, a web part. Um, sure. So that's how. So prior to that, um, they were using some some Horizon desktops to deliver lab content. Uh, I know in it was somewhere between 2010 and 2012. I'm still a little fuzzy in there. Um, they were when we got the Teradici code. They were using that to do the remote okay. access to, uh, I, I to Teramark. That, I think. <laughs> yeah, the PC over IP w was probably 2008, 2009. I'd have to go back and look in in the view history. I know that was a big release. I want to say mm -hmm. that was view four. Somebody's going to correct me out there. Sean Massey's going to be listening along to this episode and send me a DM on Twitter and goes, oh, it was exactly on this because I, that or Johan, and I'm sure I'll get corrected. But I want to say it was in the View 4 release-ish time frame where we brought in PC over IP support. And and they did use that. I remember there were, so I wasn't part of the team at the time, but as a customer, I remember looking kind of at the architectures uh, you know, when they would put big posters up in the lab area and kind of show this is how we're connecting to lab cloud. Uh, they had Teradici, the, the physical appliances they were using, like gateways of some sort to connect to the uh, the remote environments. But I, I don't know much about how Horizon was used otherwise. Hmm. It's always interesting to see how we start to incorporate what we have in the platform. And then when we fill the needs and then of, of certainly where, where that was at as far as building a repetitive product and then being able to then turn that into a product that is now our, our lab platform as a whole. Well, I think to your kind of where you're going with that is one of the things that surprised a lot of attendees when we talk to them at the big events is they can say, well, how big's the pipe that comes into this venue? You say, well, it's actually, you know, fairly small because all we're doing is sending, you know, screen Moment. data. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting time. I, I felt like 
it, a, another good transition in the land of HOL. You know, and I'm a, I'm a kind of community guy, so I sense things, and I don't really care about the business element as much as other people do. I care about the community and what are people learning and th that kind of thing. And so for me, I also watched it become more of a core business element. HOL became something that was part of the you know uh, adoption workflow of you know buying VMware, starting to do labs, or even before you closed a deal with a big company, mm -hmm. you would see labs be part of the pre-sales process, right? Or uh, And so I saw that start trash. And then they started talking tracking codes and, you know, and then how many labs are you delivering and how much revenue pipeline is that generating? Did you experience any of that during those, those years of transition? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we kind of started out as, hey, look, we'll just make the labs available for free and people can take them and, you know, hey, it'll be great. And and then we kind of looked at, um, you know, we, we talked to users and we talked to, to our SEs and people liked using our labs, you know, just, hey, I'm going to get in and kick the tires on this new product, new version, right. whatever. Right. Uh, some people would actually like deploy one of our lab environments so they could test something they wanted to do in production. Say, hey, if I make this change, can it be done live or does it require me to, you know, reboot my hosts or reboot VMs or whatever? So it's like, it was a sandbox environment that was available for free. And, you know, from the community perspective, that's awesome. Right. right. Um, and, and then we started, uh, the SEs could use it for the same thing where, Hey, I just want to show a customer something real quick, or I want to give a demo. You know, uh, we always tell people you can take the manual that's in the lab and just throw it to the side and go freestyle because they are live environments. And people did that all the time. Yeah, all the time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so then, you know, we kind of evolved that to uh, you can host your own events. So if you wanted the HOL team to deploy 25 copies of a given lab, that's because right. you I wanted to run. Yep. 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 Yeah. Yep. And so that's kind of where the tracking codes came in because we could say, okay, you know, this business unit or this SE was, you know, had 25 people. We deployed those and, you know, you could kind of do some math and say, based on you know the customers that attended this event and then the purchases that happened for that software, you know, you could say. You know. <laughs> Sadly, and this this gets into the how you know how the sausage is made a little bit too much, yeah. but. Um, <laughs> I would be in, I was in digital marketing. So the community team worked because we have blogs and we have VM 10, which is a web property. We worked in the web team, right? You know, the, the community team was part of the web team because it was web infrastructure was delivering the community enablement. And somehow we get into these conversations where they'd be like, oh, look at us. We generated, you know, $1 billion worth of revenue from all our stuff. And it, you dig into it and, and you'd be like, well, they were taking credit for HOLs that were being done online as Legion, you know, and that, that, that was somehow generating these, this customer revenue. And I just stand and sit in the corner and I raise my hand timidly and go, uh, you guys know that by the time somebody's doing an HOL, 80% of them have already bought the product. They've made the decision that they were going to use that product and they're just going learning the product and that that's post sales. That wasn't really you generating more revenue for the business. I hate to tell you. And they just look at me and growl and, and so, no, 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 no. We know we're doing this. I'm like, okay, never mind. I'll just let it go. But there was like, it became this and my side of the house of, oh, look, you know, HOLs are generating because you can, anytime you you touch a customer, you can give it points and you can then, uh, you know, go into the sales force and accumulate, you know, and then track how much revenue that customer generated. And somehow that touch point, so HOL generated that revenue. And I'd be like, okay, maybe some instances, 20% of those instances are correct. Somebody came through and took HOL and it convinced them to buy something. But 80, 90% of us just going, hey, we want to go learn something. And somebody, to your point, Doug, uh, I, I, they got their NSX certification. They've never installed NSX. They never had NSX on-prem. They just went into the NSX lab, got you know, you got root access to a VM with NSX, blah, blah, blah. And they did all their NS, they got a pre NSX. Somebody had a training course out there for free online and they did it all. And then they went and got NSX certified, right? Uh, like, how'd you do that? It's like, we just did the HOL prompt. You know, we got a access to the switches through HOL labs, right? Yep. And, 
And and I think for me, that's what HOLs have always been about, right? It hasn't been about lead gen marketing, but I, I do see that it is part of the cycle as a customer. It is a key resource that people use. And I'm not, because I'm a community guy, I don't know for sure where everybody's using things. So I, you know, I step back and in my corner and I don't raise my hand very much anymore because that, <laughs> that's too real. So, but it, it, it has, I, I'm sure it crosses across the customer life cycle journey, right? I probably on all spots. For sure. And yeah. I like the the education aspect too, right? So I've even talked to some managers at the bigger events and they say, well, I don't really need to take these labs, but I have people who would really benefit from them. And so they'll, you know, kind of build a quick curriculum for their their staff to take certain content as part of their onboarding process. You know, so they're using it as kind of vetting for, for new people or training for new people. Uh, the nice thing That's is they don't have to give someone root access to their production environment. They can say, go do this lab. And if you blow it up, no, no big deal. Yeah, that's right. That, that, that's right. Um, Matt, any other things I got, you know, I got more questions for Doug on like where he thinks he's going to go. He says he's got a different job now. So, you know, we are. Community <laughs> I was podcasts. just going we to follow up on that. This, so this yeah. being, you know, a little bit more on the community side, Doug, you had mentioned that you have transitioned over to an, a, another role within the, mm -hmm. the VMware ecosystem. If you feel comfortable about that, can you talk about that transition process and, and what you're currently doing now? Sure. Uh, so, I guess to to level set, I am back. I'm with the hands-on labs team as a as a volunteer this year. So I'm a, what we call the lab principal. Full circle. <laughs> so I own a set of labs, and then you know we get those created for the events. Um, I moved on to a a role in cloud incubation. So I work on new and emerging products in the cloud space. So uh, the VMware Cloud Disaster Recovery Ransomware Recovery is one thing that I'm working on. Uh, cloud Flex Storage, uh, that sort of thing. So kind of getting those products uh, incubated, talking to customers some more, and uh, you know, kind of getting their feedback, feeding back to engineering to making sure make sure that the products that are created are something that people can use or want to use. So you um, live in the CMBU org now somewhere in, in that, or what, what org does that live in? Just cloud I mean, business. C. Lost audio there real quick. So uh, what, what group? So I live... I, be you work in the uh, in the sales org. Okay, all right. Oh, I mean, uh, I'm go. tightly associated with uh, CIBG, though. Yeah, it's going to say CIBG, Cloud Infrastructure Business Unit. Yeah, there you In go. A second, right. my yeah. audio is no, no problem. Um, now I'm just pausing because I don't have a uh, a follow up question that makes sense. But what I would say is that um, we've announced doing, obviously, uh, Explore in Europe, where we've announced Explore next year. Uh, so I expect the lab space to continue moving forward uh, as we transition to a, a Broadcom entity, right, come November 1st, I think. Uh, if we're going to be here, we're going to be Broadcom employees. And I know we've already started to announce a lot of the stuff. and. Uh, since HOL is part of that flow, I don't see a lot of things changing. I see that we'll still have things online. Matt, what are, what's your impression there? Oh, I mean, we can't. Look, I mean, we're we're asking to to gaze deep into the crystal ball here for both. You know, of course, we know the events have been announced for next year, so that there will be That's an right. explore yeah. in some fashion. Uh, can we say that? The, you know, HOL will be there for certain. No, uh, I, but I would think that if we're trying to, to keep some part of what is known as, you know, the, the VM world and VMware Explore ecosystem is moving forward, that in some way, shape or form, that HOL will be there and will have a strong presence as it has always had throughout the duration of those events. Yeah, and, and there's two elements that make me think that the, the nothing's got, not that much is going to change. One is 
we've already announced that we're doing Europe. Uh, we know that the Europe, everything is as steady as she goes. And we're going to continue, you know, doing Europe exactly the way, uh, sorry, Barcelona, explore Barcelona. So I, the labs are going to be there. I've seen them on the maps. So uh, that's, that's all happening. Uh, which, which Doug, we just, you know, mentioned while you were, you were uh, audio fritzing there that uh, we expect this to continue on, right? We don't expect this to, you know, we can't say what we don't know, but we have announced explore in Europe next year, a uh, US, US next year. We're obviously going in Europe. That's across the, the, the Broadcom threshold. So I don't expect a lot to change uh, with regards to offering up labs. And I know they are looking at all the platforms and how we deliver everything, uh, you know, and how to optimize our platform delivery mechanisms. Um, much the way, and I would say that maybe some of the the Broadcom topics will end up in HOL. What would be some of my guesstimates? Because it's it's a very mature platform, right? So I see a lot of that, a lot of what we're seeing here continuing on, right? Like I don't expect any major changes, right, from from that. And what I think Broadcom really wants to focus on is deeper penetration into large accounts, they want their customers to be happy. So I think that uh, they might consolidate, you know, various products and maybe they'll collapse some orgs or maybe they'll do something. But I think the key enterprise products will continue on and they want deeper penetration. And what does deeper penetration mean? It means get rid of shelfware. What does get rid of shelfware means? It means teaching people how to use our products. How do you teach people how to use their products? HOL. So all I think that layer is pretty safe from a standpoint of what they're going to be focused on. That's my two cents, right? Like, I think and of that course, Eric, we should call out while HOL, you know, we focus in on the Explore events. There is the, 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 the HOL site that's out there, right? HOL.VMware.com. And of course, you know, the complimentary product with that uh, over at testdrive.VMware.com for you know, a little bit deeper runs, if you, if you will. And if you don't have access to testdrive.VMware.com, reach out to your sales team or if you are so entitled to your customer success team and they can sponsor you with an access code over to those. And you can enjoy those at your leisure from home for many of the you know elements that, that are out there. Will they be the absolute cutting and latest greatest labs that are they're, they're, the, you know out there at the Explore event? Uh, maybe not, but eventually those uh, products will end up potentially in those platforms. That's and a good question. You can you can enjoy them now uh, at, uh, from the convenience of your home. That's a good question for Doug, Matt, which is what's the timeline from when the new labs end up at Explore to when they show up online uh, for people that can't make it to Explore? Very good question. So uh, it's kind of every year we tried to say uh, they'll be about a month out from Barcelona. It really depends. We kind of re release them in phases. So they've actually released some of the labs from uh, Las Vegas online now. So uh, just it's a matter of getting those those labs copied over to the other clouds so that they can be hosted there, uh, you know, for the the public consumption. That is but, that you know, follows up another question. How many clouds are there when you're talking global lab delivery? You know, for Europe, US, APJ, or is there is it more complicated? So for uh, for the typical day to day lab uh, lab clouds, there are there were three. Um, so they were all based on uh, last year. They were all based in uh, on the west coast of the U.S. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so one of the things we found is that where the labs actually run doesn't matter so much for the user experience as um, getting access from whatever you know the the RDP session or the uh, the VMRC session into the lab uh, desktop. I guess the pipes are big enough now and fast enough. Electrons are pretty fast. You know, the, maybe you get a quarter second lag or half second lag across uh, or across the planet. A, a full loop on the planet is a, a second or something like that, but a, a half loop, maybe half a second. So I'm sure you guys deal with that. Do you guys, do you, this is not really your bag of tea. Now I'm just talking, right? But uh, do you think that they cache some of that? Do they, you know, you host it in a cloud, but do they cache any of this stuff globally, like Akamai or anybody else? 
it can't really be cached because it's live environments. And so it's actually a WebSockets connection for the console. So it's a bi-directional, almost like a, a video kind of thing. So. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, right, yeah. So you're just live streaming. Yeah, you're not actually yeah. running anything. Yeah, um, <laughs> local in the country. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, Doug, other thing that I'll have to ask you, because we are coming up at the top of the hour. Are you, I remember right, you're in Colorado, but like, uh, does that right? Or is it somewhere? Where are you based in these days? I'm in Arizona. Arizona. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. So you got close, very close. <laughs> That's not that close, but okay. That's a whole 10, 15 degree temperature difference at least. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, Arizona. All right. So what kind of, what else do we, all right, I, we would, Matt, we typically ask like, what excites you for in technology next year? Everybody's AI, ML, anything, uh, you know, you know, you're the labs that you're volunteering for now, um, what excites you for things in the future or even in your day job? You know, what, what, what excites you about what you see coming down the pike? Well, I think the, uh, you know, applications of AI uh, are definitely going to be interesting. So the whole co-pilot thing I think is, is really uh, interesting going forward is how can we make our jobs easier and, uh, you know, reduce the, the opportunities for human error. Uh, and then also for my day job, uh, the ransomware recovery stuff that we're working on, I think is really cool. And, uh, you know, it's all over the news, people getting hit by ransomware. Um, we kind of like to say that it's a, it's a matter of uh, when rather than if these days, because it seems this, these attacks are getting just more and more sophisticated. And so right. our ransomware yeah. recovery solution is like a, you know, giving you the ability to roll back um, if something bad happens. That's a, it's, it's true because I got hit earlier this year. We talked about it in the podcast and they wanted 40,000 Bitcoin for like three or four VMs that I had running and none of it was worth anything like that. So, <laughs> you know, I had, I had to go back and uh, the federal government put out a decryptor, right? That VM, you know, for vSphere because my vSphere stuff got encrypted, my VMs. And, you know, there was a process to go through it. Eventually it didn't work. So then I just had to build everything from scratch, which was not the end of the world, but uh but it took me a month to go do that, right? Um, so mm -hmm. it, it does happen regardless of who you are, small, tiny, bid, mid-sized robots, AI. I think they're going to use AI to go figure out how to get into us, right? So yep. um, So you took a, the MGM yeah. approach, Eric. <laughs> See, Doug got that one. Rebuilding what it did, from scratch. Yeah, did that? Is that what they did? I, I didn't pay attention I, to I'm, I'm assuming for as long as they were, were down, right? I mean... They just decided this to is, uh, this, yeah. We're, we're going to go on an entire tangent here, but this is one of those things that, that we often talk about in a disaster plan, right? Where it's one thing to have the backups. It's another thing to put your run book in place for recovery. And the automation that is out there with the tooling that we have uh, and the incorporations that we have into, let's call it the disaster recovery life cycle and ecosystems that's out there with not only our internal products but partners as well allows you to test those run books and i think mgm could have done a little bit better in that given the, the length of their their recovery yeah. here to the systems to doug's up. point which i think also as well is i think there's just a need for a product that i say okay i want to pay x thousands of dollars a year depending on my scale and vmware gives you a product that just makes sure that it's running right doing the right stuff so that if this happens a half a year from now i can you know use the product to create what i need to do to be back up and running right in some time frame well and i think that the challenge we're seeing is it's not the same as a typical disaster recovery where you say i'm going to pick a point in time before the meteor hit right and recover all my good snapshots from that point in time with ransomware it's like each machine can be impacted at different times you could have been impacted three months ago and there's a machine that's kind of just going out and mapping your network. So that creates additional challenges for the whole process. Cool. And chaos you know, monkey behind it and testing against yeah. that. Yeah. I yeah. can sense a whole podcast where Doug is going to come back in about three or four weeks and we're going to get him on. We're just going to spend the whole time talking about the whole process of ransomware and how do we recommend everybody do it. And is there a product that's coming out? And I don't know anything about it. So it'd be interesting to talk to you and get some 
insight. Sure, yeah. sure. Yeah. All right. I see uh, future are... episodes with Doug and Mr. Plankers, and especially once we get to start to peel back the covers from when the CISO, if MGM decides to do a public disclosure uh, of the, the attack vectors that were used, I'm not sure if they're going to go into that. They may or may not, but it would be a fantastic uh, episode to, to dive into. Yeah, it would be just to just to talk about the vulnerabilities that ha that they exploited, right? Yeah, Doug, um, you're in Arizona. We should talk a little barbecue because we do live stream this, and you want to see what Doug beer looks like. Go to YouTube.com/slash V Barbecue V B A B B A R C U C. I don't know, V Barbecue. I don't know. You're, you you named that. it and made it complicated. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. just it's V B A R B E C U E V B A R B E C U E and Bar check it out. B pool Q. Yeah, and uh, go check out what Doug looks like and say hello to him next time you see him. Uh, Doug, do you get to do any barbecue out in uh, Arizona? I do. I've got. Uh, I can do barbecue pretty much all year. Since the weather's generally pretty and nice, do you do you smoke with pellets, Traeger? Do you use kinks grilled charcoal, or do you use uh, do you just gas grill? You know, and call it barbecue. Oh. I'm just, what's your strategy? <laughs> I, I've historically, uh, so I, I built this like Franken smoker out of an old Weber kettle. Um, so I was using wood. Uh, I just got a pellet grill, so I'm going to try that out probably in a couple weeks. That's a lot of fun. Yeah, I got my finally got my pellet grill uh, about a, a half a year ago, and it's a lot of fun because you just go smoke everything in the planet, right? You know, you you, you <laughs> catch you catch anything you can and put it on the smoker, and uh, you're smoking everything. Eventually, you get tired of the smoke, you get tired of that flavor, but for the first amount of time, it's a lot of fun to get that that flavor. And I still owe Matt Lungeth a, a Traeger. I I'm just gonna gotta go on Amazon. This I'm gonna just do it. I gotta go. I gotta go make that happen for you, Matt, so that you you know, so you can. I, I tell people like that when I say go have children, and then when they do have children, they go, "You son of a, you you know, you made you talk me into having children." I say, "Yeah, because I just want you to feel the pain, and you can be down here with the rest of the sodomites, you know, grinding away on the on the." I, I promise that if there aforementioned uh, piece of, you know, um, Traeger shows up, would yeah. just happen to show up that we will be doing live streams. I mean, apps will we'll move the, the we'll, Matt Langeth home office uh, outside and the camera studios. next to it. smoke yes, and, billowing out. Right? Yes, absolutely. It'll, there you go. Add a whole entire new element to our live stream. And that last we'll do Tony Foster. You got anything on the barbecue front? I do, I do. So I did uh, barbecued quinoa. Barbecued quinoa. Okay, quinoa, yes. I know what quinoa is, you know, and how do you yeah. make barbecued quinoa? So what I did, um, I have a, a nice stainless steel bowl that I like to use on my grill. Uh, put butter in, put my... Uh, um, quinoa the actual grain in yeah um, and browned everything got it nice and uh crispy so to speak on the grill added my water closed the lid um and let everything cook like you're supposed to um and i got this uh really good really uh rich flavored quinoa um on my grill First so you basically you basically pot cooked it on your grill, right? But it picked up enough smoke from the from the grill environment to to give it a flavor. Yeah, interesting. All right, there you go, Matt. That sounds like something you could do, right? Even yeah. on a gas grill. I mean, you know, it's just one step <laughs> off of boiling water. So I mean, right. exactly. it might be feasible. Like, pretty soon then. you're going to say, "I put my crock pot on my grill, and then I plugged it in, and I, you know, and I, and I, <laughs> like, I don't know how that works. But I believe you." Well, Doug Beer, thanks a lot for showing up. Good to see you again. Uh, I hope everything goes well over the next month or two as we transition into Bodcom. Uh, we thought we would have some uh, old guests that were our favorites come back, and you're one of them. So thanks a lot for showing up. It was fun to see you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. We'll be back again next week. Until then, everybody go get some barbecue. Have a good life. Life's short. Got to eat some food and enjoy yourself. We'll be back next week.
Recording paused. Thank you, Doug. Sure.